other thing I want to do, and of course I often do this, is uh, I guess I came saying I'm going to read from the, the hologram of Cicero of the heart. What did I say? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, that's okay then. Uh, so I want to uh, read this new uh, piece of some uh, very new poems, and then I'll read you just as a kind of teaser. I'll read you a few poems about this, uh, this uh, wonderful new book. And I guess in a way of thanking Will for his work, I could sort of uh, dedicate this poem. It's, uh, it's kind of a poem from John Hayes, uh, the last poet who, who died in 2011. Morning Barge. This morning, scant white dust, the dun to dull hills across the river, framed in my window of a tug, horses as barge of cellulose ghosts, Bushes this load, their smothered sides of golden dust and trees on the river, away the red gray sea. And the fog dampened morning, no swirl of east wind whipping the mountains of saw dust on the barge of morning, carries no memory of leaves, no forest remembered, no branches moving in the walls of trees. At the end of the journey, in the air conditioning, some pale office only papers rustling beneath a weary hand, reminder of belief. That's what John Hayes turned out. It's called Collar. It's also about Alaska. Collar. While the butcher fillets a nice fat sockeye salmon, the woman next to me in line says, I'm from Alaska. I say to the butcher, trim around the gills. That's called the collar, she says. Finished, the butcher is about to throw away the bones of the collar. Do you mind if I take them? I'll use them to make fish soup. I'm from Wrangell, she says. My sister died. My sister lived in Wrangell, died in a plane crash flying from Petersburg. In response to my non secretary, I let slip. The non secretary I just did, she says, goodbye. A perfect stranger, she walks away with my collar and bones wrapped in a brown winding sheet, goes home to make this soup. Outside the Greyhound station in the river. We stand around outside the bus station, barely a coffee shop, smoking sipping our colas laced with bourbon, waiting to continue to the far reaches of eastern Oregon and Idaho by one of the major highways leading east, following the route, route, of, the route, the route, I'll say it, the route of the great river of the west. Bored by the smoke at the top, the long journey ahead, and even the scenery, I move away, spot atop a power pole of gold. With one red, yellow, black eye, he watches us, the insouciant green filled doll. Watched us pile out of the bus earlier, but he has other interests. His eye is the Rondell insignia on the top wing of a 1915 biplane, the Belgian Flying Corps. While we file back into the bus, he considers his chances of being an ace at the clothes, fish eagles, our fockers, and junkers, he dreams of glory in the thin, dry air high above us. And if you ever want to see a beautiful eye at call, look up this stuff. It's called an original. I checked it out. The Belgian flying for the city, it was just like the eye of that seagull. I heard a far stretch for some reason. Be careful when you hang your hat. I'm going to call my thumb box. I lived in a streetcar in Kansas, in a salt box in Maine. I lived in a tent in berry fields on a boat in the Pacific. I lived in a gandy dancing shack along the tracks and an abandoned bar still smelling of grass, hanged and burned it down. In a tent of cockroaches, bed, bugs and fish and traps. I lived in a Perry Mason motel the cigarette ghosts of transients along the snake of Idaho, and the Quonset in the Panamanian jungle with soldiers 
a trailer in the New York mountains across the line from Las Vegas. I lived in a logging camp deep in the burned off, logged off forest in a ranger station in the blue state of Joshua Tree National Park. But I did not bury my heart in any of those bows except perhaps one. Though the memories of the nights and days spent there, I keep my unpaid bills crammed into an old desk drawer, afraid to look at them. They're so overdue, many of the dates are faded and water stained. The drawer is difficult to open. A peek would be enough to get me started on another journey. Meanwhile, I wait for the bill collector to arrive, for the sheriff to pound on the front door, arrest me, confiscate all my melancholia, faded hopes, false leads, those pieces of paper, the evidence I should have burned when I had the chance. I was in Paris a couple of years ago, looking at the neighboring windows, and uh, I began to create this fantasy. The gray men started with Windows look toward me the first day of one hangs the French flag. I watch that one window where daily the flags change. The second day's flag is exotic, New Zealand Southern Cross. As my coffee cools each morning, I hope to see the flag draper begin to imagine a woman hanging the flags, a beautiful Parisian. Face peeps from behind today's nationality, the American flag. Then a hand appears, takes the stars and stripes down, replaces them with a white flag, shakes it out like a tablecloth. In return, I symbol for it with a large white handkerchief. The white flag disappears, she replaces it with a star and crescent. I leave my post at the window. Go down seven flights of stairs to the Turkish sidewalk cafe, order a cafe au lait, pretend I'm reading an American of Paris, its title visible from the street. I drape my white kerchief like a flag over the back of the table's only empty chair. Chewing fellow seats, this is something you call. The waiter brings my bill, a slip of white paper on a small saucer. I put onto it money, enough to pay for a cup of chai. He brings me back my change on the same white saucer. I pick through the coins, leave one or two with these. He again takes the plate, soon returns. This time it has a teaspoon of fennel seeds on it, which I take up put in my mouth as I leave. Walking away, I chew thoughtfully on what has just transpired, wondering what other marvel I'll see today. I chew the seeds of fennel, refreshing my breath, and cleanse away the rest of the cobwebs, now the steaming sweet milk and chai has awoken my senses, hoping the chewing will bring forth an answer to why we have so much and they so little, or is it the other way around? Flying fish. You all know this from a song by the Nobel Prize winning poet Hunter Kipling. On the road to Mandalay, where the flying fish is played, and dawn comes up like thunder in China across the bay. Flying fish. On the high steel deck each morning, as our gray ship slid through troubled waters, when we swept down fore and aft, we swept up flying fishes, kept them, hoping that breakfast was the usual cornmeal mush and toast made from stale and moldy bread. Flying fish, exoplativie, means sweeping outside. We would have swept outside on the deck, gladly shared it with the fish to avoid the tropical heat, escape the fetid air below. We could believe, along with the ancients, that the flying fish left the water to sleep on the land. 
as we dreamed of sleeping back on shore. Instead, we woke to the seven bells of morning watch, watched the moon until a stern on the port side dawn broke, war's thunder brought in yet another day. Hard water. I was talking last night about Tucson when our family lived there about water. Water so hard that when its scale collected in pans, a hammer and a chisel were needed to get it off. You had to let the water settle and cool in the fridge for days before you could drink it, even after time, like hard water, some conversations not easy to swallow. Like the one I had the other day with the form of life, an argument over possession of an abstract seascape. Hard talk, pieces of her words, mine, traces of bitter minerals settling back down to the bottom. Sands disturbed from time to time where we lurk in the cloudy water like moray fields. Uh, I love this book, The Atomic Man, because it's so beautiful. And I have to say, my son did the artwork. He's wonderful things, and I have a lot more money than I do, but he's a great guy. But uh, this book has a funny start. Um, I, I love saying this. Uh, flying back from New York on JetBlue, I wrote this funny little poem in Spanish. And uh, well, this whole thing got started. But I'll read it to you uh, the way I wrote it, and then I'll read it to you in English. And it's a made up word, quinto logico. La llave del agua es el aire, el viento es la voz de la tierra, la granada es la mala del corazón. Fifth logic, air is the key to water. Wind is the voice of the earth. Hollow wind is the sister of the heart. And uh, I didn't know what I was unleashing when I used this title. I forgot about the Persephone and I forgot about the Jewish legends and the Arab legends. I was just thinking, well, uh, the hand grenade. <laughs> In the Montparnasse Cemetery, <coughs> some of you got the joke. Granada's grenade was also popular. In the Montparnasse Cemetery, those bells mean something, you said. At first, I barely hear them and think that they are the angelus from a nearby church. But it's the jangling, claiming assistance of cemetery guards, ringing handheld brass bells before closing the high iron gates perambulating like monks calling the friars to prayer or sweeping the graveyard of mortals before the sun sets. Darkness falls, the call awakens souls like Beckett, Baudelaire, and Vallejo, summoning them to their nightly circumambulation. Beckett cast a fishhook eye on the rehearsal, asked the shadows, which of the shades is the go? Baudelaire escapes his fan of humming verses of Poe, seeks comfort in the arms of Jean Wall. Rested by Nato, longs only for the snow-capped enemies. Whatever, these, whatever those parapathetic souls rehearsed or mumbled in prose or verse, and even if the tide of Paris traffic drowns their crooning voices, they will permit no living. This is a particular vulgar poem. Uh, it has an uh, epigraph by Jose, uh, Jose Saramago, a uh, Nobel Prize for the Portuguese <coughs> novelist. We are blind when we lose respect for ourselves and others. Blindness. In solitary, well, I should say this is a true story. In solitary, he claws his eyes out from their sockets. Hideous, medieval, this desperate ripping out of one's own eyeballs. 
They meet him in the courtroom to face his accusers. He wears dark as caves, dark as moonless night shades. I think only the caves, those empty sockets behind obsidian glasses and dare to testify against. His alleged crimes, offenses against society's rules over steel and machines, a matter of traffic and going the wrong way on a one-way street. His defense, he's crazy, proves that he's to a psychiatrist's satisfaction. But a victim who's not satisfied, her car blew, her leg broke, and she wants blood or at least money. What do they want of me, he asks himself. Why am I here in this place? Lawyers, voice, drones, bees, the nodding judge glances at his watch. What is so horrible that he wants to see no more of this world as he goes tap, tap, tapping with his white tipped cane? What is his destination? Song for a Caribbean afternoon. Around an anchor, the dull gray boat swirls in a lazy cyclone that balanced a few inches of yesterday's afternoon shower. On the bow, a smudge of what's left of the name sunk. On the stern, a tattering rag to Cuba or Puerto Rico. The fisher Man long ago abandoned the boat. The shore he sets forever at the bar beneath palm fronds in a hammock, hammock swinging between two poles. The barman sleeps until he hears oak for one. The transistor persists, repeats the chorus. In La Bahia de Palomar, la luna voy a pescar. Palomar Bay, I'm going fishing for the moon. I'm going for La Luna, I'm going fishing for the moon. And now, I really want to fall. I can't find it. Maybe that's good. <laughs> oh, no, here it is. It's about one of my favorite taverns. Changed its name several times. It used to have a great name. Mecca Bells. And then got changed to Dad's excuse. They got changed to Clinton Street Wine Bar. Mecca Wells. He's standing in the phone booth on the corner across from the Mecca Wells, talking when he could be drinking. It's only 12. The tavern's still open. He's talking and bleeding. He's bled a pool big enough to soak up three bar towels. He's having an earnest conversation. I say, hey man, what happened? Not much. Someone threw me through a plate glass window at a party. Who do you call it? My girlfriend. She's still at the party. 
Want to talk to her? I sent someone to call 911. I keep expecting him to hang up or pass out. Got it going now, he finally says, deep into the phone, out of dimes. Hey, buddy, you got a dime? I shake my head. I hear sirens across the street slip back into the knuckle wells. What's going on, the barmaid asks. Not much. I got to talk to him on the phone. I think that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, I'm now very happy to introduce uh, the other leader, David Axelrod, who you all know very well. And as he said, we've got since spring at least, and maybe before, it's something that's happened at least, we're showing up at least together at least, and I guess maybe because we share at least two different, it's fair to say all of them, on two occasions, so two different kinds. Um, David is a, Co-director of the Eastern Oregon University and Low Residence in Mark Bay. He's the author of at least six collections of poems. Uh, the most recent, What Next? Old Night, which is published again by Lost Horse Press uh, last year. Uh, published also. And he's going to have a new book out in the uh, uh, coming year called Folly, which I'm uh, uh, waiting for with anxious breath. He says it's a funny book, and that's good. Uh, his previous collection, The Cartographer's Melancholy, won the Spokane Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the Oregon Book Awards in uh, 2000, Oregon Book Award in 2006. He's also the author of a collection of uh, environmental essays about the interior of the trouble intimacy, I love that title, which appeared in 2004. Uh, his poems and essays have been published in New Letters, Boulevard, Alaska Quarterly Review, Gaming Review, Quarterly West, River Sticks, Verse Daily, uh, Poetry USA, uh, The Adventure Monthly, uh, Need I Go On? Uh, no. Uh, he is uh, a professor of English and Random. You all know that. I'm very happy to be here today. You like that list of people? It only Stop, got, please. Oh, God, I like it. It only got shorter because I couldn't do it. Oh, God, yeah. Thank you for making all that up. Actually, I'm going to make all that up. There's the computer through there. Thank you. Very good job. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, I uh, I was thinking tonight, uh, I've been doing a lot of readings uh, in the last uh, 10 months since uh, What Next Old Life came out. And, I almost always read the same poems because I feel confident about them. And I thought, well, tonight I would uh, read the ones I've never read before in public and hope that it doesn't become painfully obvious to me and to you why uh, I haven't read them before. Uh, so I'm <laughs> start out with this one. Uh, it's called... Uh, on Lortzingstrasse, and I, I lived for a while on a, a part of the town um, called um, uh, Ludwigsburg, a part of town where all the street names had names like Bromstrasse and Schubertstrasse, Beethovenstrasse, um, Brucknerstrasse, and Lortzingstrasse, and you know. Uh, it, it was fine. Who's Lortzing? You know, I mean, all the rest of them were pretty obvious. You know, the, the greats of of, of, of uh, German music, and um, I had no idea. We didn't have. It had to, there was no internet or anything like that uh, to use. So um, one day I was at the post office and I was handing my uh, my uh, letter over to the guy. Uh, to uh, put postage on it. He looks at me, he's a big, tall Prussian guy, <laughs> six nine, and you know, uh, 700 pounds. And he Lord Singstrasse, and he launches into this rhapsody about Lordsing. And really, the only thing there is to tell you about Lordsing is he wrote a couple of comic operas, most of them deeply nationalistic and nasty, right? <laughs> but, uh, Somebody liked him. Right? It, uh, he was the he was the unknown one 
on Lord Sinkstrasse. I envy the postman who stands on one pedal, gliding down the sidewalks, delivering his route from one block of flats to the next. He breaks, hops off his bicycle, and jogs to a halt. That's good style. But there's substance here, too, because from the yellow panniers emblazoned with a hunting horn, he lifts letters posted in the provinces where pupils once studied penmanship and retirees fatting themselves and sweating it off at spas still write in a cursive that's as oblivious to the deliquescence of old friends as the letter writers are clueless that anxious, semi-literate guest workers occupy those old flats now, fearing perhaps there's been a mistake, a visa revoked. So I envy the postman, his mercy, his bell, his snappy, albeit drunken salutes, and how confident he is no one will discover where he stashes those elegant missives in the privet, between empty beer bottles and bird's nests, a sacrifice to what goes astray. I've gone astray, opening those envelopes and promising to read all the gossip to ill-tempered songbirds, the local pronunciation of whose names causes me endless trouble but who's prom who have promised me in return will make a part. I, if I bring millet, sunflower seeds, a ball of suet, and a bowl of sparkling water, they'll bring the grippa and a lot of mocking old songs. Let me join in the merriment I cause, stumbling over my out-of-kilder sentences and off-key grace notes laughing at myself being laughed at as in a comic opera, because I'm the rude, like Peter the Great, wandering in more civilized nations, unsure what's really going on, and not understanding what exactly is so goddamn funny. <laughs> I uh, read a, a poem here called Stray, and it is a, it's a, it's a very vulgar poem. That's why I've never read it before. Uh, and, uh, but that's okay. And it's, I wrote this poem intending to write another poem. And I'll read the poem I intended to write later. But this one first, Stray. First, he lost the wolf that roamed inside his brain, lost his morals, rolled in grease behind the butchers, lost his dignity, his disdain for commuters who kicked or recoiled from him outside the station. Teenagers coaxed him in back of the public toilets, human sons of bitches stuffing him full of franks laced with Drano embarrassing him as he staggered back to the street and retched in a puddle, uh, his whole gut full of foaming bile, and right there beside the curb with people waiting, the buses heaving by, the riders watching in disgust, and all he required, all he asked for, was someone along those austere corridors of concrete apartment blocks to take him in. Almost anyone would do for a means of shelter, a bowl filled once a day, only periodic torments to discipline his de degenerate urges to hump your friend's thigh, snuff her s or stuff his snout into her crotch. Raise your hand, he's quick to recognize the sign to grovel, whipping his tail between his legs, curling up and licking the discharge from the tip of his repulsive cock. Pulling at the end of his leash, 
he gnaws at it a little playfully, allows himself that fantasy of being some cur dog's equal who lost the wolf that roamed at night in the boreal forests of his brain. Scolded for nosing up to the dinner table, he backs away apologetically. The blushing tail dragger, that a boy, old knife, forgetting why he turns a full circle before he settles into his rags. A couple of years ago at uh, the magazine of the salt that Dr. Gordon and I edited, for some reason we got all these pet poems. But they're all about how nice pets are. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Who are you kidding? You're, you're dog. I know what it does. <laughs> I know how it behaves. But I intended to write a different poem, and, and I wrote this uh, degenerate poem. And, uh, and, and for years, literally, seven years, I was, you know, I, I really wish I had written that other it was just about going in and getting a kebab, a sandwich, right? uh, a Turkish sandwich. And uh, that's all I wanted to do. And just as I had finished this book, and it had been accepted by Christine at, at Las Cruz, I wrote this poem. I just sat down and wrote it. And I was like, finally, it's here after all this time. But this is what I intended to do when I wrote Stray, the kebab stand. The only connection is there's a dog. <laughs> but briefly. And so the city seemed as cities sometimes will. Empty. As though suddenly abandoned to contagions. Malicious approaching across plains. No taxis, not even a stray dog. Just trackless snow. Rows of plain trees and dark facades. So we walked burdened by something unwieldy as a 55-gallon drum, and kept trying to shift its weight, hold it in our arms one block to the arsenal, put it down to rest, then lifting and trying to steady it again. We turned at the state archives and passed through a damp tunnel, the shortcut to an arcade where light streamed from a shop at the far end, music throbbing through steamy glass. As we pushed the door open and shook off snow, an earnest man took a piece of flatbread from the oven and assembled in the palm of his hand slices of lamb, shredded leeks and red cabbage, a dollop of yogurt, a spoonful of pepper sauce, and then folded it, cut it in two, and held out a half to each of us. For a few coins, we could join all the others, eating where they stood in the crowded room, bumping into one another, while on a TV high in a corner of the ceiling, a woman sang beside a balustrade along the Bosphorus, whirling to the feet of drums, until she became a flame rising into the air, and all eyes were staring. So happy everyone in that crowd at that moment was to confirm our conviction that this is the only world where the weight of desolation in its streets that night could not obliterate what is necessary and beautiful as a woman and a song. And even as she ended, we cheered her because, after all, we were spellbound and knew we were nowhere near the end of it yet. That's what I intended to write. And I, and I was so delighted when it finally showed up completely unexpected. Um, and, and truly unexpected. All right. Well, maybe I won't. No, it remains, it will remain uh, uh, unread. Well, yes, it makes sense if I read that one next. This is called Swallow It. And uh, I think it's all fairly straightforward. I don't know what to say about it. Swallow It. It's the command you've been given before with the broccoli, right? 
holding in your mouth at the table for hours on end, right? Not until you swallow it are you getting up from this table, Timmy, right? So, so. Give it a good shake. Go on. Disturb the neighborhood. Rattle the gate and rusty key lock. Nobody goes in there anymore without first asking permission. And who do you think you are to ask, Mr. Outlander, Mr. Here on a temporary visa? It's really no concern of yours, that walled-off corner of graves, tumbled stones, root-bound rows of a beautiful city's 19th century Jewish bourgeoisie, still held on suspicion. Whoever watches from behind lace curtains readies a reasonable answer in case you dare to ask why. You might make a scene in the street addled by how they allow nature this slow erasure under pines. Indecent, this haunting little tableau. Don't you wish you could let go of it, relieve everybody of the past? But when you think about how memory keeps score and how they keep even graves of Soviet soldiers tidy just on the other side of the wall, that's an insult, like votives burning before the fascist Pietà. And you have to admit it, you're at fault, acting obstinate as a child, refusing to swallow. Though in the end, naturally, you'll get hungry and eat whatever you're served. You know this, and they know it too. You have to swallow it, and so you do. Yes. <laughs> this is called um, Crossing Synagogue Plots, uh, as the date, 10 November uh, 2005. Uh, the anniversary of Kristallnacht, uh, and it's really weird, and, and, and it gets very depressing. Uh, you go from town to town, little town, every little town in Germany virtually, there is a little memorial where they burned all the synagogues down uh, on November 10th, 1935. And so um, it, it gets to be a bit of but uh, we lived in the town we lived in. There was one, and uh, we walked through it all the time, as you'll see. Long after time scrapped its train, the train we're on glides underground, the engineer applying brakes. So we ease forward in our seats, who always sped into the future, losing momentum now. At every halt, Boredom disgorges passengers, plenty enough of it for all of us to have grown weary of this commute, from main station to the end of the line. The stairwell's venting stale air, the sticky handrails and depleted hope, all of it, all of us, past and future, emerge from a chrysalis of diesel fumes and scatter down a dozen streets leading away from the center, where those long dead broke glass and set fire that obliterated God. Refrain ye, the Zohar advises, from seeking for the thing that is hidden from thee. What's hidden in the folly of blocks of stone recovered from ruin, ten lindens planted in honor of words that called splendors from the void, vessels ablaze with the radiance of the mind. See ye any manner of similitude? Please, dearest one, don't let them see you cry. If you need to cry, cry only later. Otherwise, you'll never find your way to the end of this. Here be sorrows numberless as those complicit with the crime. Drifting below us in layers, no one should disturb again. The glory of this world emerged from in the glory. I'm sorry. The glory this world emerged from, inhabited by an absence 
grown so ordinary, we take a shortcut through it to transit and transit to and from work, leaving tributes of gravel on the gravestone of God. Well, my apologies. I, I, I haven't read that before, and I was completely uh, mystified by the, uh, what I was reading. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I'm just rather lingering here uh, over that, uh, that, that, that the mess I made at the end of that poem. Um, I think I'll just exit to the next thing quickly um, uh, and uh, hope to forget about that. Uh, this, is a, this is a poem called Our American Friend. Um, and uh, these poems were written during uh, the worst period of the um, of the uh, Iraq War in the winter of 2005, spring of 2006. Uh, Fallujah was going on and uh, the massacre uh, in uh, Leah, I think. Uh, so, um, and, and, and I don't know how it was covered here in the United States, but in Europe it was covered rather graphically. And it was, uh, a, it was a bit, it was a bit, people were a bit testy with Americans. So if you could in any way disguise the fact of your nationality, you did. Because <laughs> you didn't really want to get into arguments with anybody. Um, but this is called Our American Friend. If he hadn't yet departed the 18th century concert hall, with its plush velvet walls decorated in the warm flesh of paradise, his cozy moral inertia guiding him back toward the time, like a high-strung hiding trio. Then he was a bat. A wormy stench filled his seat with flies. He was afraid. He could hardly breathe. He'd spent half his life until then pending arrival in another city that awaited him, like a jackpot awaits the prize winner of a sweepstakes. A new life floated at the horizon he was always traveling full of aspirations, lapping up daydreams like the milk of infinity. And now the house light suddenly rose, the crowd dispersed down marble stairs into the street and all its mystifying tumult, people dashing for the underground, arriving at high speed in more distant and dreary suburbs, and nobody certain they had enough fare to reach their stop before the power failed. Come on, we said to him. The show's over. But he just stood there at the lobby door, dumbfounded, watching streets empty, rehearsing simple phrases in a language he hardly remembered a word of. Not even the easy ones, like pardon me, please, bread, and thank you. So, uh, this book was written during the worst part of the Iraq War, and, uh, uh, and it's a pretty dark book. It ends, though, with a long, very joyous choral poem uh, that I hope someday I can actually have a chorus maybe read. But uh, uh, it's a, a hymn to the future. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's really a quite different tone from the remainder of the book. But, I'm going to finish with just a couple of short poems, and, uh, and then we'll be done, and we'll go on our way. Um, I, uh, that last poem, Our American Friend, takes place in London, and uh, I figured while we were in London, we might as well stay there and see a few more sites. Uh, and this is called Crossing Walker's Court. My, my youngest son lives in Soho in London, and uh, uh, I, the first time I visited him, we arrived basically at dawn. And, uh, and he said, oh, we have to go get a few things at the store. So we walked up. Uh, and it turns out he lives in the red light district, you know. And all the prostitutes are just wrapping things up for the night, you know. And they live here, you know. The drug addicts are, you know, staggering back toward corners and so on. And it's, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, don't worry. This is London. There's nothing to be afraid of. And so, okay. So, crossing Walker's Court. Who's sadder? than a horror, that furrow plowed all night by the iron share. If you have daughters, 
estimate what's the value of the loss of one in a weight of grain. What is she worth in jars of cooking oil? If you add an ivory comb, do the scales level? Grant her at least the integrity of her rage and endurance, because she's still standing at dawn. A little sore, you can tell, by the way she walks like a distance runner after having finished the marathon. Bow-legged, arms akimbo, dress caca. She's yelling in a tongue I don't recognize, though her meaning squeezes the alley tight as a truck delivering the day's fresh goods, forcing me to wobble athwart her curses. It's the oldest street in the city, and short, a thousand-year-long walk to the next block where grocers are opening carts, arranging boxes of kale, strawberries, spuds, dozens of crocks of spices, antipasti, sesame oil, the transactional economies of daily. Nobody really has any time for a red dirt village that won't speak a whore's name except to spit. Her father and brother vowed to crush her skull if she returns. Washerwomen begin the dawn routine, heaving buckets of bleach diluted in water across the columns. That's her Russian pimp. She's cackling at now on the stairs. He's just added up last night's receipts, ignoring her, but looking up in wonder at the lucent sky. How could we fail to marvel at that, too? Tranquil new day, the sunlight burning away the cataracts that sheathe the eyes of God. And I um, guess one more, really one more. Uh, this is titled Stet, and uh, uh, that is uh, an editorial term, uh, capital S-T-E-T, uh, sometimes with the exclamation point, uh, uh, let it stand. Uh, you've made a change, let it stand the way it is. All right? <laughs> this has nothing to do with editorials. Editor, uh, edit, copy editing. Before anything else, make allowances for winter and let the young athlete bobble the thrown ball in his hand. Let there be seasons as before, melting snow, sun and condensation, rain and hail denting the roof of a Chrysler coupe. Let there be fresh mown grass, but also mud and therefore metal, blacksmiths, boot scrapers drilled into thresholds. Let there be faith in whatever happens next but not so much in evil, okay? If there must be mistakes, let there be learning from. Let there be a guide. Let affections happen most. Make room for strangers. Set a table. Leave late at night for skeletal and despondent and sleepless brain full of unconnected words the man leaping into flight before an express train. After delays, exasperation, the missed connection, let there be laughter as everybody finds a seat, settles in with a sigh before a little doze. Always allow there to be a woman with long hair swimming in the languid current in a forest stream. Let the ravens fold themselves each into its bleak branch on a foggy day near a bridge. Blackbirds sing in a steaming world of trees, whether we say trees, baumann, bois, or arbalace, it all depends. We cheer likewise, no matter the tongue, if we say fig, orange, nectarine, or date, because that's the way the world wants most to be. Please, please, let there also be in the wind that rolls, oh, let there be snails who ripple more slowly than grain in the wind that rolls across graves 
in the Ukraine. Let madness heal the path of the snails who graze close. Closer to earth in the heat of the prolific decay that annualizes riches. Let plow mix the nutrients. Let seeds replicate in dense stalks of wheat, oat, and barley. Let the young green germ be sweet when we peel away the tight sheath. Let the sheath one day split and lovers shudder. Sure, let there be doubts, anxiety, difficult languages, schedules, and a rendezvous that can't be kept. But let there be a beer and wine after the late arrival. Let God wish us all to be happy. Exclude no one, except maybe gangsters who won't give up. But maybe, if we let there also be naivete, we can believe they can also be persuaded. Power and wars are never enough. So no need to distort desire. Let no one ever dismiss affection. While we're at it, let's favor days off in the shade in August, when the world is taking care of itself in all its good time and amber light. Let there always be fresh water running cold and clear over smooth cobbles just outside a window where someone is sleeping. Let the sleeper be a child dreaming of the nearness of her mother, which is the sound of water washing over her. Let the sleeper be an old man dreaming of the garden he still plants. Let this world be wet with hope and not Russian roulette. Let us be friends, though we don't know how to express the intent. Let it be gestures and the meaning obvious. Let love be the text and the editor mark it after the failed revision in caps. Stet. Thank you all for coming on.